Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Antonio, and on behalf of the Comets team, I'd like to thank you all very much uh, for being here today to listen to these presentations. Um, so we are going to talk about our work over the past uh, few weeks, um, linking meteor shower observations with detecting long period comets um, using machine learning. So before we get any deep into the details, I just want to make some quick introductions here. Um, so as I said, my name is Antonio, and I'm joined here by my team, uh, Andres, Susana, and Marcelo. And we also want to make a big shout out to Jack Collison, who was an enormous help in getting much of this work done. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me kind of frame the problem here uh, for you all. So comments. Uh, these are dirty snowballs flying around the solar system. They're rocks, they're ice, uh, some other stuff. Most of the time, they're hanging out in the farthest reaches of the solar system. Every now and then, uh, one of these things' orbits will be perturbed such that it comes in the inner reaches of the solar system. Sometimes we can see these, right? Every now and then, some of those can be perturbed and their orbits can actually intersect with that of the Earth. Um, obviously, uh, an impact of the comet would end very badly for most, if not all of us. So, the idea is we want to know when these things are going to happen before they happen, right? And right now, directly detecting these things is kind of difficult. Um, we can really only see them when they're about at the orbit of Jupiter, which only gives us maybe on the order of a year uh, worth of preparation time. So, we want to extend that warning time. And we're going to do that using meteor showers. You may be wondering what that has to do with anything. Um, so the idea here is that meteor showers, um, they basically result when comets come in close to us. Um, they leave behind a trail of breadcrumbs, right? Their debris um, tra traces their orbits. When the Earth smacks into this trail of breadcrumbs, um, that's what we see as meteor showers. And so by studying those meteor showers, characterizing the orbits um, from their, where they came, um, we can basically characterize their parent bodies and actually try to find these things. So with that, um, these were our three main objectives for this summer. The first was to improve and automate the identification of meteors uh, in video surveillance um, surveys of the sky using uh, machine learning. The second was to actually search for meteor shower streams and outbursts in these huge uh, databases of meteor uh, orbital data. And the last one, the key point here, is that we wanted to find rare uh, meteor outbursts that could be related to these long period comets. So with that, I'll pass it off to Marcelo here. Thank you, Antonio. Hello, guys. Well, let's talk about more about long period comets. Well, I'm showing you a diagram and uh, showing a uh, path of uh, long period comet. So you can see on the left, uh, comet, it's near the sun and his surface is hot, it's hit by uh, the solar uh, heating. So uh, the comet started to throw uh, debris, chunks of rocks, chunks of ice rocks. And then you see a red bar, small, then we go to the middle of the center of the, the picture, and then when the comet is going away, you see that red bar more uh, growing, uh, narrow and thin, and now this uh, debris are now doing a first revolution, and then you see debris ahead the comet and debris back in the comet. So, uh, when the Earth is crossing, passing by the uh, debris from, uh, sorry, from uh, this long period comet, uh, this for instance, we have a meteor outburst. This is from a uh, hypothesis called Wandering Trail Hypothesis. So, this is the base that we are doing our work now. Okay. Well, I'm showing now, uh, let's talk about uh, meteor showers. You see, uh, Perseids meteor showers is a good example of a comet that uh, throw debris, these are meteoroids, and this is the Earth here. And when the Earth is passing through those debris, we have a meteor showers, okay? So this is a good example 
of debris for a comet. Well, well, how are we gonna do this? How we can uh, make meteors registry? So you see the from the CAMS project a box with sixteen cameras, and then we put this on the roof, and we have this. Uh, uh, computers doing night by night analysis from meteors that are uh, registered from uh, uh, the night sky, the meteors coming. So it's a huge effort because up to now we, we need uh, human intervention. You can imagine day by day getting that data from uh, a lot of meteors network all over the world as America, United States, Brazil, Europe, night by night, getting all those data and make analysis, uh, cleaning data, because you have to separate what is a meteors, what is not a meteors. For example, butterflies, airplanes. So you have a lot of work to do. So this is why we need a new tool, a new way, a new approach, how to, to, uh, to run this data. This is why we are doing our efforts in this problem. And then also as well, with this huge data that is, uh, we're gathering, we could do this. Uh, this is a celestial sphere. This is a, a, a many points. This, each one of these white dots are uh, meteor orbits evaluated. It's uh, one day of uh, data. These colors are meteor showers that we have already known, but we have a lot of uh, data that we can, uh, could do new things. And these are the networks that are getting data to this sphere, this is uh, a web that you can go through and see this already online, okay? So this, it's also a uh, citizen science project, it's a citizen science effort to get all those people all over the world, 24 hours uh, getting meteors data and then join together in a huge cloud data, meteors cloud data. Now, Antoine. Okay, so that's the, the basic idea underlying this whole process, right? Um, so what did we actually do you know, this summer to improve these, uh, this process? The first, as I mentioned, was to automate and improve meteor classification. So this is the basic idea, right? So in these surveys, um, anytime something moves in the sky, uh, the camera picks it up, records it, we get an image, we get a time series. So in this case, this is an example of what a meteor looks like. Uh, from the CAMS survey. So here we have, uh, we have the trajectory on the left, so it's just x and y position uh, as a function of time. You can see it's very straight uh, and linear. Um, so that's kind of uh, what we want to look for for meteors, right? On the right there, we have what's called the light curve. So this is the brightness uh, as a function of time for this source. And you can see that it has a well-defined well trend, right? It has a smooth rise, it peaks. It's fainter. So that's, that's what we want to say is a meteor. On the other hand, this is what we want to filter out. So this is an example of something that is not a meteor, um, but triggered uh, the detection. Right, so here we have on the left, again, it's this object's trajectory. And as you can see, it does not look nearly as nice and linear and straight um, as, as a meteor. It's kind of messy. And on the right there, the light curve um, is basically just a bunch of noise, right? It's, it's, there's no pattern uh, which is speaking there. So the, this is the kind of stuff we want to try to figure out how to quantify the differences between situations. That's what we did. One way we, did, uh, we tried to do this was by actually uh, manually extracting features from uh, these data sets. For instance, uh, things like the straightness of the trajectory, straightness of the line, right? Um, things describing uh, the, the light curve, uh, what, what the average brightness is, what the shape of that light curve is. So we manually extracted these features um, from 200,000 objects and ran them through a random forest classifier. Uh, and it turned out to do pretty well, actually. As you can see, 
um, we ended up with a precision of about 90%, meaning 90% of the things that this algorithm said was a meteor was actually a meteor. Uh, and a recall of 81%, meaning that 81% of the things that we knew were actually meteors were correctly classified as such. So this thing works pretty well, um, and it also works pretty fast, right? So 200,000 objects, a human doing this by eye takes weeks, um, and the computer algorithm did it in a few minutes. Right? So that's the power of this method. So in addition to the method that um, Antonio just described, we also used a deep learning method called long short term memory. Um, this is a an LSTM network is just a type of neural network that can be fed in a time series and projects the, the time series into a latent space that then encodes um, the information in the time series. And the power of the method is that we can actually, we do not, we do not need to manually extract features from the time series. We can let, let the algorithm of the neural network actually learn by itself uh, what are the important features. So here we see, um, we actually fed so we fed the x, y position, time, and intensity of the time series into this algorithm, and then at the end, um, we fed it into this, uh, this LSTM network, and at the end, we get a prediction of whether the time series corresponds to a meteor or not. Uh, using this method, we obtained a 90% uh, precision and 90, an 89% recall. But uh, on top of the time series, we also used image data. So these cameras are actually collecting images. This is so, these are some examples of what the images look like. On the left side, you see some examples of non-meteors. You see lots of clouds. So clouds actually trigger a lot of detections in these cameras. You see planes, you also see birds. And on the right side, you see the meteors. So some of these meteors are uh, very bright, as in this case. Uh, some of them are behind clouds, and some of them are quite faint, so you probably cannot see it, but there's one there. Uh, so this is what we wanted to discriminate. We wanted to find you know, which of these images belong to meteors or not. So for this, we used a convolutional neural network. Uh, so convolutional neural networks have been extremely successful at image classification tasks. And we used the standard Alexnet architecture, which we adapted to this data set. And in this case, we had a binary classification, which we fed an image. And uh, we convolved, we, we implemented a few a convolutional layer, layers followed by max fully layers, and at the end we had two fully connected layers. And instead of the 1,000 um, categories used in the image net classification, we had two uh, classes that we wanted to uh, determine either a meteor or not a meteor. In this case, uh, we obtained an 88% precision and 90% um, recall. Here we compare the, uh, the three methods that we used. So we had, we had images, we had tracklets, uh, for the images, we used convolutional neural networks. For the tracklets, we used a random forest and an LSTM. And uh, we see overall the LSTM uh, obtains the highest F1 score of 89.6, followed closely by a CNN of 89.5. But the significance of this beyond the numbers is the fact that every night, um, meteor astronomers have to uh, process these uh, large amounts of images that come in or time series that come in and they might get like, around 500 time series or uh, uh, 500 different detections and they had to manually go through these um, through this data and now that we have algorithms that, uh, can automate, that can automate this process so that it doesn't have to be manually done so that the data that actually goes through to do the science is actually cleaner. So. Now, um, yeah. I'll take it from the things. Um, so the data that is being collected by these camera networks, uh, we're already producing about a million videos. And as we implement the methods that we have developed in this program, we will be able to collect a lot more in the time to come. And it's going to create this really rich data set of meteor data that will allow us to learn more about the natural history of our solar system. So we already have, as I said, about a million meteors that have been identified, and we have orbital parameters for them. And we wanted to see if we could already start like extracting some information out of this data. Um, basically, what we did is we took all of our meteors, a million of them, and we partitioned them in time um, of the year, say we divided the year in, in octants, 
And today I'm just going to show the data for one of those programs. Um, at each different time of the year, you get different types of meteor showers. <clears throat> so the first thing that we do is we partition our data. Sorry. Then we reduce the dimensions. And for each meteor that we have, we have multiple parameters that we have collected. Some of them are like physical parameters that describe this meteor. And some of them are directional parameters. So we want to reduce this data so that to see if we can extract the structure that is multidimensional, basically. Once we reduce this structure, we apply clustering algorithms just to see if we can find groups of meteors that are similar to each other. And then we try to validate this data. So in this way, we go from single meteors to meteor showers and potentially to others. This data here just shows this uh, partition data. We're looking only at the solar longitude period between 90 and 135 degrees. If there are about 125,000 meteors, each of those dots is one meteor. If you just look at on the left hand side, this panel shows you that there's a little bit of structure. We're, we're looking at time and space. You can see that there's some st structure and, and these on the right hand side, those are the meteors that have been assigned to different um, meteor showers by humans. But just by looking at it, you can't really say that there is a lot of structure. So we wanted to see if we could extract more information out of this data. Now what we did is we took the same data and we started to like explore it. The first thing that, thing that we did was a principal component analysis, which takes all of the variables and it creates a new set of variables for a data set that are orthogonal to each other and they are organized based on the amount of variance that is explained from our data. So here on the right hand side, you can see that there's not a lot of clear structure, similar to the previous uh, plot. On the left hand side, the variable factor map shows that different parameters contribute to the variance of inner data. But this is not a very good way to actually analyze the type of data. So we had to look at a different types of, of dimensional reduction algorithm. For this, we use um, Disney's, the distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. And what this does, and again, each of these points is one meter. What this uh, algorithm does, it takes points in multidimensional space and it projects them in a 2D space so that we can understand it. And it groups data points based on similarities in multidimensional space. And what you can see now is that the structure that was previously hidden from us is starting to reveal itself. You see different clusters, and those clusters are groups of meteors that have similar um, orbital parameters. We wanted to validate if we could identify known um, established meteor showers from this data using this approach. Remember that the clustering, or these, these actually this multidimensional scaling procedure, did not include the layers for for organizing itself. And one thing that you can see is that different clusters, we're here I'm just projecting uh, one of those variables. This is the, the, the angle that the meteor enters Earth. And you can see that different clusters have different angles. So we're finding structure that is real. Right? And we have these for all of the parameters that we have. But then what I did is I projected the known uh, assigned established uh, meteor showers. And what we can see is that, that this, this algorithm correctly clusters the known, these are the top five um, meteor showers. And these green ones here, those are the parasites. That's the data that Marcelo showed in that plot in which you saw um, the comet debris going around planet Earth. So we know that, for example, these, these, these meteor shower and all of these guys intersect Earth's orbit. That's why you have also a potential for collision with comets, right? Then we wanted to see if we could then identify new clusters. And for that, what we did is we took uh, our data set and we clustered the uh, DB scan, which is a density based spatial clustering algorithm. What it does is it takes points, again, in multidimensional space, and it will cluster them based on density. And it will separate different clusters based on areas of low density. And what we see again is that we identified the previously um, identified meteor showers, but in addition, we find several new independent clusters that were previously completely invisible for us. Because you have a human looking at three dimensions, 
you have a computer looking at all of the dimensions. So these, each of these new dots or clusters <coughs> potentially belong to a new meteor shower. So now we have somewhere to look into. We have an idea that we're picking up the right stuff because when we project those known clusters are still really old. And we also wanted to look at potential outbursts. Outbursts are important because these are the ones that we believe could be informative for us detecting long period comets. And an outburst, again, is a high density of meteors that occurs in a very short amount of time and space. Okay, so using our similar procedure, we identify several clusters that have those characteristics, right? And, and some of them are embedded in larger meteor showers, meaning that they probably come from the same direction. Some of them are independent, which is very interesting. But basically, we're able to find groups of meteors that have that signature. This doesn't mean that each of those points is a long period comet that is going to come and hit us. But one of them could be. Right? And what we do, this allows us to, to, to generate an orbit, to predict an orbit for that long period comet. And that's what we would look into. The summers would take the data and then do a dedicated search based on those orbits that we identified. And so our study basically um, has developed a way to automatically identify images uh, from meteors, from non meteors, from image data. And our performance is already above or approaching human level. We can also recover known and unknown meteor showers. And finally, we're able to identify those outbursts. And that's the important point that we want to express, besides the new meteor strings. That's again where we would look for those long period comments. And so this, this study again gives us just a window into the complexity of our universe and the beauty of it and how much information we can extract from the work that we do just by doing these, these type of citizen studies. And with that, I just want to conclude and thank the, everyone in the, in the program and NASA, IBM, and BD, SEBI, and the CEO. So we'll take some questions. How about a round of applause? So, so the format is what we're going to do is we're just going to go to our reviewers. If you could speak for just a little bit, your first thoughts, initial ideas, or you know, kind of uh, I guess directions for, for future investigation. Um, perhaps uh, um, Pete or, or um, Jesse would be. Yeah. Well, I used to support on this, but I'm pretty skeptical. Skeptical of that last chart because you picked out a couple little pieces that looked like noise to me and others you didn't. Uh, so, I, I mean, it, I, I'd be more convinced if you actually had some other data that was either valid, like, like known or, or unknown meteor storms that you picked up. So, so um, basically, what we do is I separated the plots, but it was all found in the same plot three front. So, it, it identified at the same time as the and the, the small and the large clusters. The only validation that we have right now is that the large clusters were known data. We can't validate any known data if somebody finds them. But we totally, I, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, this is a, a, a step forward, and it needs to be validated. So yeah, there needs to be some error bars on it. I guess that's what I, my point is. That, I didn't. Sure. I, I, that, that's an interesting plot, and it, there's a couple little pieces that look like noise on it that you picked out. So, so, so basically, what this can does it also allows it, what it does it, it excludes the noise data. So the noise data points are actually, which are basically different than the others because they're they have low density. Uh, those points were not posted. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Pete. Julian, no. Oh, yeah, uh, so uh, we had a great interview presentation, and also uh, the fact that I have met you guys before, so uh, I kind of know the project well. Uh, I'm not well, but you know, at least uh, as a brief idea. I'm not a uh, planetary uh, scientist, so uh, well, uh, this is more like a uh, uh, you know, machine learning stuff, but uh, 
So I have a question regarding uh, you know, picking the you know, best model for the uh, meteor shower classification. So, um, you know, the first um, two uh, models, the LTSM and, uh, you know, uh, Random Forest used the trackles, right? Yes. And uh, CNN used, uh, you know, images. And uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, it could be kind of, you know, fair to compare, uh, you know, two models because, you know, they are using uh, different uh, in data sets, basically. So, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, you know, one thing I was concerned about, you know, picking the best model. Uh, for each classification. Uh, but other than that, I think uh, it's a, you know, there was a really you know, great question. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh, so I guess not over on this slide, you have about 10% of false positives, if I uh, interpret this correctly. So we, we have a saying at NASA, which we use a lot, which is treasure your anomalies, because you can learn a lot from those 10%. So the question I have is, uh, what are those 10%? What, what sort of detections are they? And do you think you can learn this to improve your algorithm? Yeah, so we looked at the, um, the wrong predictions, so the false positives and false negatives. Um, so what happens is that um, a, a lot of the um, meteors that are being missed by the network are really, really faint. So I guess, um, yeah, the network kind of misses them. Because um, it's uh, it's actually uh, it's actually difficult to the human eye to see them. I went over like these images, and it's also hard for me to see the meteors sometimes because they're so so faint. So I this is one um, one error, and um, there are many. O there are also other so sources of error. Um, for example, uh, we think uh, the data annotation itself. There, there's errors there as well. Uh, some things also look a lot like a meteor, but they're not a meteor. So um, the network sometimes gets confused there. Uh, I have some examples of the false positives and false negatives, but I'm going to show them, but I can show you later what the, what the errors are. But yes, we have looked into uh, what the errors are, and we think that one perhaps actually uh, cropping the image around the detection point might help. So instead of feeding the whole image, just um, feeding a crop. And that might help because then it's actually more localized than what's one thing. Um, and the other thing is actually uh, cleaning up the annotation. So we have two humans annotating the data that we had, but this is, you know, this this could be a, a much larger effort where we actually make sure that annotations are more accurate and, and therefore the network company will learn better. So. Ian, as a machine learning person, I don't know a lot about comments. Um, and I immediately start thinking about what kind of information we can get in the meteor showers. I was wondering if you know what percentage of comets are actually traveling in a way that their meteors arrive on Earth where we can see them. I was also thinking maybe one factor that could make the meteors more interesting to us is that possibly comets that are more likely to strike Earth in the future are also more likely to send meteors our way. Have you done any kind of probabilistic modeling to estimate what percentage of comets that are dangerous to Earth end up sending us these meteor shots? Right, right. So I don't know. I, I don't forward that to the experts on meteor so, astronomy. Or perhaps something to use. In fact, we have a probability of one in 60 million years to a big comet, a kilometer size to hit Earth. But we have also on our surface, Earth's surface, more or less between five. 10% of the big craters, uh, maybe 50 kilometers, 10 to 50 kilometers are from long period comets. More than 10 craters, craters in our own world. So I guess what I'm asking is, if we know that there's a long period comet out there, how likely is it that the meteor showers coming out of the debris from the comet will be observable in our atmosphere? Uh, before the comet hits us. Okay, so this is why we are trying to find out meteors outburst. Meteors outburst, it's exactly the phenomena that we are trying to find out because they are kind of signal that a long period comet could be uh, arriving in a few years, for example. We had an example a few years, weeks ago with the Borisov comet. It's a long period comet, and with 
using this hypothesis, it was evaluated that we would have an outburst, and I think it was in the 29th, 30th July. And in fact, uh, we observed using a video monitoring lunar impact, we observed a lot of impacts on lunar surface in the exactly moment of the peak. Okay, this is the way. Thank you. Great, thank you. Victoria. Thank you very much. This was a really good start on tackling a critical problem. Um, we uh, know a lot about comets, but we're not quite sure where they all are. So thank you, I appreciate that. My next question is, of the, of, uh, the work you've done to date, uh, the next, what we would hope to do is that it would be brought forward and would be implemented, okay? And, and uh, you could use it in academia, citizen science, whatever. So what's the, the, the prime problem to tackle next in order to start to move forward to that goal? Um, so, as far as moving this forward and implementing this, yeah, I mean, I think the, we need to work to implement these models right now. Um, we were thinking some kind of ensemble, you know, averaging the predictions, you know, better classify meteors so we can clean up these large databases. Um, but I think as far as, you know, actually classifying the outbursts, um, I think that the validation is probably, you know, validating the clustering and, you know, making sure that you can actually observe these things when they happen is probably the biggest thing. Thank you. Jesse. Um, actually, to follow up on that, of course, not all meteors come from comets, right? They can come from asteroids. And is, how are you going to differentiate and how are you actually going to validate that your clustering is correct? So, um, you're completely right. Uh, meteors come from different uh, sources. The idea for the long period comets is to concentrate on the output, so it's like shortly those concentrated groups of, of meteors, and not all of them are going to be from long period comets. The best thing that we can do right now, because we can see them, is to learn from those predicted orbits and look into those orbits and see if we can see something. It's 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 um, we're reducing the, the the space in which we need to look for. Right now, we have nothing, right? Whereas if we do this, at least we have 50 places to look into. Right? That would be the first thing. In terms of the meteor showers, I think that because they, they, some of them are peri periodic, uh, we should be able to, to validate those pretty easily just by expecting what they will reappear in the following period. So, so are you pulling orbits out of your clusters at this point? We, or is that a next step? That, that's the next step, exactly. So, so from each of these clusters, we can produce an orbit. Excellent. Oh, well, thanks so much, everybody. We give you a round of applause. And, um, and, um, go ahead and have a drink. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>